death because it's been defeated. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Let's dare to say, then bring the morning that seal the promise. downtown. I'm Pastor Christian. We're going to continue in worship. We're going to sing in English and in Spanish, and I hope you came ready to worship. So, Karate, lead us. Come on. Let's sing our praise. I praise in the valley. I praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm short. praise when I'm loud I praise when I'm numbered. Praise when surrounded, yeah. Cause praise is the water, my enemies drown in. Come on, why don't you sing this with me? As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to pray. Yes. 
seated family church happy resurrection day family church my name is jimmy scroggins and i've had the privilege of being the lead pastor of this family of churches since 2008 this is my wife Kristen, and we've been married 30 years this year and we've raised our family right here at family church jimmy and i want to welcome you to your neighborhood church this morning and let you know that we are so glad that you're here whether you come every week or if this is your first time we hope that you feel right at home and we hope that you'll take a moment to fill out the Connect card by scanning the code on the screen or on your listening guide. We want to get to know you and pray for you this week. That's right. Family Church is a family of neighborhood churches. Your neighborhood church, where you are sitting right now, exists to help you and your family discover and pursue God's design for your lives. At Family Church, we base everything we believe and everything we teach on the Bible because that's our book. The Bible gives us instructions for every life stage and every life situation. And we believe that Jesus should be at the center of our lives and our families. So whether you're navigating singleness or marriage or parenthood, or you're thinking about leaving a legacy at this point in your life, there is a place for you here. And Christian, at Family Church, we are extremely serious about fighting for the next generation. We are. So parents, camp season is actually right around the corner. Your kids and students can experience a change of pace and a change of place and a change of heart this summer. Our family church camps are designed to combine high spiritual impact with lots of fun that your children will remember for the rest of their lives. Yeah, our goal is to walk alongside you and to help you take your next spiritual steps. We wanna pull you in, we wanna lift you up. We wanna bring you home to be part of God's family and to be part of Family Church. So make yourself at home and know that you're with family. Today is all about Jesus. Let's lean in, sing along and celebrate him together. And from our family to yours, he is risen and happy Easter. All right, thank you so much, Pastor Jimmy and Miss Kristen. Pastor Jimmy, thank you for doing that. Uh, hey, uh, good morning, everybody. Happy Easter to you. My name is Derek Simpson. I serve as one of the pastors here at our downtown campus, and it really is uh, great to see all of you this morning. It means a lot to us that you're here. And uh, I'm excited this morning to uh, share with you about a few things that you can expect to just as we go through our service together. So uh, if you came through the doors, as you, as you came through the doors, you should have received a program that looks just like this. 
I just want to show you a couple things. On the front side is this QR code. You can always scan that for up-to-date information about things that are happening across our family of churches and how you can be connected. And on the back side is this, uh, this Connect card. And I just want to... Uh, I want to invite you for a moment. If this is your first time to Family Church, and I met a lot of you this morning, this is your first time here, you came with a guest or you came with a regular Family Church attender, uh, I want to encourage you to take just a few moments and fill out this Connect card. Give us at least a name and a phone number and email address uh, that's good for you. And then uh, what I want to encourage everybody in the room to do is to take advantage of this backside and share with us some prayer requests and some God stories and things happening in your life. Every week, there's hundreds of people at our church that pray over each one of these cards individually. And so I encourage you to be specific and be bold in what you're asking God to do in your life and in your family. And uh, we'll be happy to pray. We honestly will be honored to pray uh, with you and for you uh, this week. Uh, I do want to give you a kind of a preview of some other things that t- will uh, take place this morning. So in a few moments, Pastor Christian Ramos and the team will continue to lead us in a few songs, praise and worship. We'll put the words of the songs on the screen. I encourage you to sing and participate in that. Uh, we're going to have, of course, a Bible study today from the book of Luke. Pastor Jimmy Scroggins is our lead pastor. He'll be leading us uh, in that Bible study. And uh, we're going to celebrate some fun family things as we go across uh, through the day as well. But right now what I want to do is give you an opportunity to to uh, actually connect with some people around you. So here's what I want to invite everybody in the room to do. Uh, Set your things aside. Stand up to your feet. If you're a family church regular, I want you to take the initiative. Go find somebody you don't recognize or you don't know. Introduce yourself to them this morning. All right, you can make your way back to your seat. And as you do, if there's some extra space uh, on, your, on your pew, why don't you go ahead and scoot to the middle just a little bit. We still have some people coming in, trying to find a seat. And so let's make room for uh, all of the folks that want to be here uh, this morning. Hey, one of the things that we're about to do is take up an offering for something called Relentless Pursuit. Relentless Pursuit is a family church. It's our strategy. It's our funding strategy for how we accomplish our mission of building families by helping them discover and pursue God's design. And we do that. Relentless Pursuit funds now 15 neighborhood churches and a bunch of neighborhood schools uh, in the southern part of Florida. And so uh, what I want to I want to invite you if you want, would like to participate in Relentless Pursuit, you can always do that online, or you can give in the buckets. We're about to do that right now. So if you're on the far left hand side of the pew, there's a black bucket with an uh, FC on it. Why don't you just grab that, pass it to your right, uh, and some folks from our team will come and collect those. It really is a joy to participate in giving and building God's kingdom together, and so that's a fun thing that we get to do every uh, single week. You know, God has been so kind and so gracious to our church, and we, have, we get to see and celebrate every week the fruit of what we're celebrating this morning, Easter Sunday, which is the power of the resurrection of Jesus to transform individual people's lives and change their lives for eternity. And we do that every single week when we celebrate believers' baptism by immersion. And so uh, in just a few moments, we're about to stand and sing. But as we do, we're going to show you some people, introduce you to some people whose lives have been transformed by Jesus and who have made the decision. They've received Jesus by faith. They've made the decision to to be publicly identified as a believer in Jesus and join Family Church. And uh, when we do that, I want to encourage you to celebrate with us because it is a, it's a, just a fantastic thing that's taking place and it's unique and it's a hand, it's, it's a sign of God's blessing on our church. So let's go ahead and stand to our feet. Let's prepare to worship and celebrate baptism together.
the power of blood. I'm so glad that my freedom wasn't based on what I've done, but the goodness and mercy and the power of blood. Oh, oh, Yeah. 
and welcome back and happy Easter. We're so glad to be here with you. I'm Dwight Rogers. And I'm Yamari Plazas. And we are so glad that you're here to celebrate King Jesus with us today. Amen. He is risen. He is. And right now, I want to let you know about something fun that just happened. We have a new song that was released by Family Church Worship. Yes. Uh, Yamari, I think, See the Blood, right? See the Blood. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. It was a little test for you. I know. I listened to the car, I promise. <laughs> okay, perfect. You have it on repeat? I do. Perfect. And so you can find this new song on Spotify or on Apple Music, and you can put it on repeat. There's other songs that Family Church Worship has written, and you can listen to those there as well. And all of our songs are biblically based and our team is just so incredibly talented and I'm just so glad Very. that we are part of a church that invests in in the music that we sing. I agree. The team, I love the way that they write these songs together yeah. um, with the Bible open. Yeah trying to really make it biblically based and uh, they have so many good tunes that just speak to the heart of uh, every man and what you're going through yeah. in life right then. Oh, so yeah. tell me about, I know we just finished Luke. Yes. All right. That was great. It was a long series. It, it was, was a great long, series. Very in-depth. But it was good. I love yeah. going deep into it, really digging in. Now we've got a new sermon series coming yeah. up. Tell me about it. Yeah. It's called Making the Case for God's Design. And we're going to be in this series for about seven weeks and it's talking about a lot of different cultural topics that are very hot right now they're like hot takes yeah well things like objective truth yeah uh, human, human value, value. Yeah. what else we got family oh, structure yeah oh yeah some some very hot topics that yeah. i think you'll enjoy hearing about and yeah. hearing and them many from a more. biblical perspective yeah uh, a lot from pastor jimmy will be coming on mm -hmm. maybe even have a few others that join us in the, during that time oh yeah it'll be a great time so you can plan your visit today for next sunday and be a part of that first week of making the case for God's design. Well, let's talk about giving a little bit. Yeah. What's our giving strategy at Family Church? Yeah. Tell, us, tell us a little bit about that. For sure. Our giving strategy is called Relentless Pursuit, and we believe that God is in relentless pursuit of us so that we can be in relentless pursuit of others. So we have a one fund giving strategy. Yes. And so our family of neighborhood churches, we have 15. And they come together, they give, and it's a safe place to give, Family Church, you know? So the one fun strategy, I, I really like that. It resonates a lot to me. Yeah. Um, I like that I can't uh, throw some money around and put my name on something. Right. There's no names on anything. Yep. I love that. Yeah. It's just such a great strategy, giving from the heart out of the overflow of the abundance that Christ has given us. It's all his anyway, right? Yeah, it is. We, we are give. the managers and That's he's right. the owner. That is so true. Oh yeah. And so you are a part of impacting the lives of our kids and students and also helping us to plant new neighborhood churches. And so Jensen Beach was one of those neighborhood churches and yep. it's number 15. And you, when you give, you directly impact that. That's and right. so we are about to go hear Pastor Jimmy live and preach. And so grab your note taking materials and we will be back real soon. Once again, happy Easter. Let's pray together. God, thank you that you are holy forever. 
thank you that you are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we're grateful that we get to worship you today. God, we've come today to recognize and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, but we've come to meet with you, and we're asking for you to meet with us. Thank you for bringing us all into the room today, extended family, friends, neighbors. Some of us have been to church every Sunday for all of our lives. Some people in this room, it is their first time to church. Some people, it's their first time in a long time. God, I pray that this will not just be another day. I pray that because we are here today, every one of us will be different. I pray these things in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, you can be seated. Welcome again to Family Church. My name is Jimmy Scroggins. I'm one of the pastors here at Family Church, and it really means a lot to us that you're here today. And Easter is a special day, and you guys have gotten up early, you've gotten your families here, you fought in the car to get in here, you got parts, you got here, and now you're here, and you guys look amazing. In fact, go ahead and tell your neighbor, you look amazing. Tell the person, that they, yeah, you guys look incredible. Hey, what's up, balcony people? Give me a wave up there, balcony people. There we go. That balcony, you guys can't see them. It is packed up there. Those must be like the most expensive seats in the house. I mean, you guys, it's awesome, awesome to have you guys here. So uh, I love getting together as a family church because it is like getting together with family. I like watching all of those baptisms. Every Sunday we celebrate baptisms in the room and by video. Uh, and I like to see uh, moms and dads baptizing their children, husbands and wives getting baptized together. And these are all outward signals and symbols of something that's taking place inside. And every time we get together on Easter, Easter is a great time for every one of us to really look in our hearts and really see who we are and where we stand with God. Some of us come to church all the time. Some of us come once in a while. Some of us, Easter's, you know, when we go on Easter, it's one of the main times that we go. And I'm so glad that you're here, whatever the case. But Easter is still a great time for every one of us to consider where do we personally stand with God. I was thinking about how important Easter is. Forrest Rose is sitting over here. He's one of our members, been here a long time. Forrest, you said it was how many? 30, 30, 39 years ago on Easter Sunday, Forrest became a Christian at this church. 39 years ago. It's pretty cool. There's a family that's out there greeting when you came in this morning, and they said, hey, Pastor Jimmy, you know, two years ago, Easter Sunday, our neighbors invited us to come to family church, and it's changed our lives. Just think about how important Easter is. So I, I don't know why you're here. I don't know what you believe. Some of you guys are, are SEAL Team 6 Special Forces Christians, and you know everything about God and the Bible. Some of you are like kind of new to all of this. Some of you really aren't Christians at all. You came to be polite to someone that you care about. And whatever the case, I'm really glad that you're here, but I'm hoping that God will still use this to define um, the relationship, to help you understand and think about who you are when it comes to your relationship with God. Now, Easter is important. This weekend, millions and millions and millions of people on every continent and every language are going to recognize and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the central miracle. It is the central claim of the Christian religion. If someone does not believe in the physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus, and by that I mean you got to believe that if you could get in a time machine and go back 2,000 years and go out there to the cemetery outside Jerusalem, you could actually see Jesus Christ coming back to life. If you don't believe that that actually physically happened in history, then you can't actually be a Christian according to the Bible. This belief, accepting this by faith, is at the center of the Christian religion. And that's why we all celebrate it and talk about it so much. But for some people... Your experience with God is every once in a while you make a really close connection with God. It almost feels like God pulls you close in a moment or in a season or at an event, but then you kind of forget. And then something else happens and you go back and then it, God kind of pulls you close. Again, it kind of reminds me of that movie, 50 First Dates. Some of you guys have seen that movie. I'm not endorsing everything in the movie. That movie, 50 First Dates, is kind of like that, right? This guy, Henry, falls in love with this girl, Lucy, but he finds out that Lucy actually has been in an accident, and so every night when she goes to sleep, she forgets everything that happened the day before. So Henry spends all day trying to win Lucy over and trying to make her fall in love with him, but when she actually does, she falls asleep, and the next day, he has to do it all over again. Some of us are like that with God. God comes and meets with us, and he talks to us, and he pulls us close. 
But then it's like we let the cares of this life get in the way and we forget who God is and how much he loves us and how much we should love him back. God doesn't want us to be 50 first dates Christian. The Christian life is not meant to be brief periods of strong emotional connection with God followed by extended periods of spiritual amnesia where we live and think like God doesn't actually exist. And the resurrection is what pulls all of this together. If you believe in the resurrection, it should tether you to God and tether you to the Christian faith. So let's read. We're going to read from Luke chapter 24. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and get your Bible out. Grab a Bible from the pew in front of you. Open up your Bible on your device. We're going to read from Luke chapter 24, the story of the empty tomb. All of this takes place on Sunday, Easter Sunday, 2,000 years ago. This is the culmination of the Holy Week story. And this is what happened. Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 1. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified And on the third day, rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all the rest. That was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose. And ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. And this is the word of God. And all God's people at Family Church say, amen. We receive God's word around here. So Jesus had repeatedly told his disciples that he was going to be crucified. Now, here's the story of Holy Week. You guys remember, uh, on Sunday, Palm Sunday, Jesus rides into Jerusalem. Some people declare him king. By Thursday night, though, things have changed. On Thursday night of Holy Week, he has the Last Supper with his disciples. He washes his disciples' feet. Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. Jesus tells Peter, before the rooster crows three times in the morning, you will deny me. And sure enough, things unfolded just like Jesus said. After they had the Lord's Supper, they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane where they had a prayer meeting. And then after that, Jesus was betrayed by Judas and handed over to the Roman soldiers. They took him and put him on trial all night before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, before Herod, the figurehead king of Judea, and before the religious courts. And all night long, Jesus was put on trial where they made false accusations against Jesus. They declared him guilty in the morning. They they beat him. Then they crucified him. And all day long, Jesus hung on the cross, his body broken and his blood being shed. The Bible says when Jesus died on the cross, he was dying for the sins of the world. In the Christian religion, the cross is a big deal. So I have a big old cross lit up right there. If you go outside and look up on the top of our steeple, the highest point of our church, there is a cross because the cross is at the center of Christianity. Nod nod your head if you are wearing a piece of jewelry with a cross on it right now. I mean, it is a big deal. The cross is really, really important. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, Jesus died for the sins of the world, my sins and your sins, and anyone who receives Jesus by faith can have forgiveness of sins because what Jesus did on the cross. But Jesus dies on the cross. Right before he dies, he said, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And then he says, it is finished, and Jesus died. He died before sundown, and that's important because sundown on Friday night is when the Jewish Sabbath begins. He dies right before sundown. Some of his disciples take his dead body down off of the cross, and they must hurry because they got to get everything they're going to do with his body today has to be done before the sun 
goes down. So they wrap him in linen cloths. Remember in the story, he saw the cloths laid on the side in the tomb. They wrap him in linen cloths. They do kind of a temporary preparation for burial. They hurry the body of Jesus into the cemetery where they lay him in a tomb. It's kind of like a little cave that they've carved out of a rock. They put him in the tomb. The Roman governor had declared they wanted a stone in front of the tomb, and he wanted a Roman wax seal across the stone to make sure nobody tried to get in there and interfere with the body of Jesus. Jesus was dead. I want you to know he was dead. He was stone cold dead. He was not in a coma. He had not passed out from the pain. And then they put him in. It's not like his, his heartbeat slowed way down. He, he, he was dead. I mean, you might think, well, that was 2,000 years. Listen, the Romans are not stupid. They knew when somebody was dead, Jesus was dead. He had been beaten. He had been crucified. He had been stabbed in the side of a spear. Jesus was stone cold, dead, 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 dead as a doornail. He was dead. And they took his dead body and they put him in that tomb. And all night, on Friday night, that's day one, he was dead. All night and all day on Saturday. All day on Saturday, that's day two, he was dead. He was dead on Sunday, early as the clock struck midnight. But somewhere in the middle of the night, I don't know what happened. We don't have a physical description, but I like to use my imagination. In the middle of the night, wrapped up in those linen cloths, in that darkness of that tomb, something happened. And God, the Father, brings Jesus, the Son, back to life. I don't know what happened. If he, his, his fingers started to move. His, his eyes started to flutter. Brain activity re-engaged. His heart began to beat again. Blood began to flow through his veins. He breathed the breath of oxygen. And he's alive. Now, I don't know how he got the stone. I don't know if an angel moved the stone. I don't know if he moved the stone. I, mean, I don't know what happened. But somehow the stone got moved and Jesus came out. And he was physically, bodily, historically alive. And if you could get in a, in, a, in a time machine and go back and you could see it for yourself. He was alive. This is the center of Christianity. And no one should have been surprised by it. Because Jesus had repeatedly predicted that he would be crucified and raised from the dead. That's why it says in the story that after the women who first went to the tomb to try to find his body, when they couldn't find the body, they were perplexed. Then when the angels told them, why do you seek the living from among the dead? Remember he told you he was going to be crucified and rise? They went, oh yeah, they remembered his words. He told us that that was going to happen. So on Holy Week, everything that Jesus said was going to happen actually happened. This is so important. This is so important. Now, the cross is important because that's how you get your sins taken away, the shed blood of Jesus. If you don't have a cross, you can't have forgiveness of sins. If you don't have a cross, you're going to have to face the judgment of God on your own. When you receive Jesus by faith, you receive his sacrifice in your place on the cross. But if you don't have the resurrection, how do you know that what Jesus claimed about himself when he claimed to be the son of God, when Jesus claimed to be able to take away sins, when Jesus claimed to be able to give you a home in heaven when you die and a resurrection body for yourself one day. How do you know that's true? Unless you have the resurrection. The resurrection validates everything. If you take away the resurrection, Jesus is just another religious teacher who was killed to death by the rulers of the day. But with the resurrection, Jesus is something different. Jesus is something special. The resurrection is what should make you believe. The resurrection, in my opinion, is what makes Christianity better and truer than any other world religion. Buddha founded a pretty big religion. It's pretty influential. But Buddha died and they burned his body up and they put his ashes and buried his ashes in various, various Buddhist holy sites around the world and you can go find them. Archaeologists have dug them up. Muhammad founded a pretty big and influential world religion. It's in the news every day. But Muhammad died, and people from all over the world go to Saudi Arabia just so they can visit the tomb where the dead body of Muhammad lies. But there is no tomb where Jesus' bones are. There are no ashes of Jesus to discover because Jesus is not dead. Why do you seek the living among the dead, the angel said. He is not here. He is risen. 
The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the differentiator. When you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's what makes you a Christian. If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you might be religious in some kind of way, but you cannot be a Christian. St. Paul sums it up like this. He wrote this in one of his letters. He wrote this kind of it's an ancient creed. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, here's what St. Paul said. He said, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. St. Paul believed in the resurrection of Jesus because St. Paul had seen Jesus for himself. So some people wonder, how can I really believe in the resurrection? Christian philosophers have come up with an argument for the physical resurrection of Christ. It's called the minimal facts argument. I really like it. Because there are certain minimal facts that Christians believe about the resurrection of Jesus that secular historians also believe about the resurrection of Jesus. So there, there are certain things that Christians believe and secular non-Christians also agree. So here's the minimal facts. First fact. Jesus of Nazareth was a real person who really lived at the beginning of the first century. Historians, secular historians, non-Christians, everybody believes Jesus was a real person. He really lived. That's first minimal fact. Second minimal fact. Jesus, who really lived, was crucified by the Romans at the beginning of the first century. Even secular historians agree on that. Third fact. The followers of Jesus began claiming that Jesus rose from the dead almost immediately after Jesus died. That's an indisputable fact. That's why the world religion of Christianity exists, because the followers of Jesus went around telling people he'd been raised from the dead. Next fact. The disciples of Jesus believed personally that Jesus was physically raised from the dead. That doesn't mean that he was raised. It means they all believed that he was raised. And why do you believe it? Because the disciples had had experiences with Jesus after he was crucified that made them believe that he was alive again. Let me give you two examples of this. So there's this guy named James. He's in the Bible. James is the half-brother of Jesus. Same mom. James had an earthly father. Jesus only had a heavenly father. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So his half-brother that he grew up with, his name was James. Now the Bible tells us that when James was a kid, and even when James was a young adult, James did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. He did not believe in Jesus, his own half-brother, until after James saw Jesus crucified, his brother... And then after James saw Jesus alive after he was dead, that's when James became a believer in Jesus Christ because he saw it and he believed it. St. Paul's another one. St. Paul had heard about Jesus. St. Paul heard the teachings of Jesus. He'd heard about the miracles of Jesus. But St. Paul did not believe in Jesus until after Jesus was crucified and St. Paul personally saw Jesus after he'd been raised from the dead. That's when St. Paul became a Christian because he became convinced that the resurrection is real. Now the disciples really believed that Jesus was raised from the dead. Think about this. Here's what history tells us. St. Peter believed it so much St. Peter was crucified upside down rather than deny the resurrection of Jesus. Andrew was crucified. James was beheaded. St. John was exiled to a prison colony until he was an old man. Matthew was killed for Christ in Ethiopia. Bartholomew was crucified. Philip was crucified. Thomas was speared to death in India. Simon was crucified. James was stoned to death. And Thaddeus was also stoned to death. All of them died rather than recant, rather than deny this claim that Jesus had been physically raised from the dead. Now, you might tell a lie, but you'd have a hard time getting that many people to die for something they knew was a lie. Those men died because they believed that Jesus really was raised from the dead. And the reason they believed that he was raised from the dead is they saw him with their own eyes. They believed it. And the resurrection challenges us to see what we believe also. The resurrection challenges us to believe or not believe, to define our 
relationship. So the disciples believe the resurrection is true. I believe the resurrection is true. Many people in the room believe the resurrection is true. But the question is, do you believe the resurrection is true? Not your mom, not your dad, not your grandpa, not your sister, not your roommate. Do you believe for yourself that the resurrection of Jesus really happened? We've got these four chairs on the stage. And whether you're in the balcony people, back of the room people, new people, I believe that everyone in this room can pretty easily locate yourself in one of these four chairs. Let me describe the chairs and you see where you should sit. Chair number one, you believe and you are being faithful. You believe in Jesus, you've received Jesus by faith, you're a Christian, and as much as you know how to be, you're being faithful to God. I don't mean that you're perfect, I don't mean that you're sinless, because none of us are that, but as much as you know how, you're believing in Christ, you're trying to walk with God, you are trying to be faithful to God. That is chair number one. Some of you belong in chair number one. Many of you belong in chair number one. This is chair number two. Chair number two is people who are believing, but not faithful. Believing, but not faithful. In other words, you believe in Jesus. If I had you check off a, 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 a statement, do you believe in the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ? You would check yes, but the truth is the way that you're living your life right now doesn't reflect faithfulness. Maybe it's a sin that you're just indulging in and refusing to walk away from. Maybe it's a relationship that's not right. Maybe you're not very faithful to church. I don't know what it is, but you believe but you're just not being faithful right now. Some of you should be in chair number three. Chair number three is people who would say, I'm not believing, but I am open. And there's a lot of people that come to Family Church every week that belong in this chair because people are coming because somebody brought them, they're intrigued, they kind of like the vibe, but they can't really say they've received Jesus by faith. And some of you are like that, and that's okay. If you're kind of a skeptic, you've got some questions, but at least saying, hey, I'm not believing right now. This isn't me, but I am open. Because if you're open, that's where God can work. Some of you are in chair number four. Chair number four are people who would say, I'm not believing and I'm just not open. I'm not interested. I've already thought about it. It's not for me. I'm here today to be polite to someone I care about. But Christianity is not for me. I'm not open. And if that's you, at least you know where you stand. But Here's my challenge to you. If you're in chair number four, I'm not believing and I'm not open. I wonder if something inside of you is at least 1% open. I mean, are you really 100% not open? Or are you just, is there some crack in the door where you're a little bit open? Because if you are, that's the space where God can work. Some of you are here. You're not believing, and this isn't for you yet, but you are open. You ought to explore that. You ought to lean into that. You know why? Because God is telling you how much he loves you. And God's working in your life right now. You ought to listen. S some of you are here. You, you've received Jesus. You're a believer in Jesus, but you haven't been faithful. It's been a while. Why don't you make Easter Sunday the day you come back to the Lord. Why don't you come back and be faithful? Why don't you repent of that sin? Why don't you walk back towards Christ? Why don't you re-engage with your church family? Why don't you say, I believe, but I'm going to be faithful? And if you're here, you ought to keep going and hold on to your faith. You ought to hold on to your faith and tell others to do the same. So what do we do? One of the things we do on Easter Sunday is we give people an opportunity to receive Jesus for themselves by faith. If you're in one of these two chairs right here, I want to invite you today to receive Jesus by faith. How do you do that? You have to come to the point where you agree intellectually, hey, I believe that Jesus was crucified for my sins. I can't explain it all, but I believe it. Where you agree from the heart, I, I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. I can't explain it. I still have some questions, but I believe it. I, and you have to receive Jesus by faith. You have to turn from your sins. Repent of your sins. Receive Jesus by faith. The Bible says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
And if that's you today, and you're in one of these two chairs, and you need to call on the name of the Lord and receive Jesus by faith for yourself, you should do that this morning. And I want to help you do that. Because some people don't know how. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray a prayer out loud. And the prayer is going to say this. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus was crucified for me. I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. And I'm receiving Jesus by faith right now. Jesus, come into my life. Save me. Change me. I want to live as a Christian from now on. And if that's you, I would like you to make this your prayer to God. If that prayer expresses the desire of, of your heart, then make this your prayer to the Lord. Just out of solidarity and courtesy, why don't everybody in the room just bow your heads and close your eyes? Would you do that for me? And then if you're here today, you're in chair number three, chair number four, you want to receive Jesus for yourself by faith, you make this your prayer to God. I'll pray out loud. You pray in your own heart. Are you ready? Here we go. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. I believe that Jesus was crucified for me. I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. I'm receiving Jesus by faith right now. Come into my life, Jesus. Save me. Change me. I want to live as a Christian starting right now. Why don't you keep your heads bowed, if you would, just for a second. I wonder if there's anybody in the room, and I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to make you do anything, but I wonder if there's anybody in the room. Thank you for worshiping with us here at Family Church at Home. Next week, we have First Connection Sunday. And it is a great time if you are brand new to come and learn more about Family Church. And we would love to hear your story. There are pastors and ministry leaders that would be so happy to welcome you in like family. Absolutely. I love First Connection. And that'll be April 7th, right? Yes, April yep. 7th. And uh, we'll have child care for your kids. Mm -hmm. And it's a great time to just ask some questions about the church. Um, kind of figure out a little bit more about who Family Church is and what we do, what we're all about. So I would encourage you to come. Oh yeah, and there is a neighborhood church near you. You can plan your visit today at gofamilychurch.org and plan your visit. We would love to see you next Sunday. And also starting next Sunday is our new sermon series called Making the Case for God's Design. I'm looking forward to this. This yeah. is going to be good. Oh yeah. Seven week series. Seven week series. It's going to be covering cultural hot takes. Yep. And there's some of them are objective truth. Family structure. And human value. Human value and much more. And so we are going to have a great time having that sermon series. So you don't want to miss that. So plan your visit today. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So it's been great being the church in here. Yeah, right? it's been great. And it so has. something that we like to say every week is we've been the church in here. Now let's go be, be the, the church, church out, out there. there. Happy Easter, everyone. Happy Easter.